Um, when I applied to Stanford, I was searching the website for a, something that would give me a reason to want to be at Stanford. They ask you when you apply sort of what you want to do or why Stanford. There's so much, so much to do and so many different cool things and the 2008 presidential election was taking place and I took a class on politics and I thought, oh, I'm interested in politics. I want to do policy and I became a public policy major. And then I got to the beginning of my sophomore year, which is when the Humbio course starts, and one of my friends who was really excited about it convinced me to go to the first day of the Humbio Corps. And I went, and they were talking about lactose, which doesn't sound like the most interesting topic, but when Bill Durham talks about it, it actually becomes a very interesting topic. And I thought, well, I'll stick it out. I can at least do this for a quarter. I'll be Humbio for a quarter. I'll do home bio and public policy, I'll double major. Um, and that's what I thought I was going to do. And I stuck that out for a quarter or two. Home bio really drew me in. The lectures and the core are very engaging. And so I dropped the public policy thing and went back to just home bio and pre-med, which is what I thought I was at the beginning. So that's kind of how I came to home bio. I wish I had listened to my earlier self instead of getting sidetracked and distracted, but I guess that's kind of what college is supposed to be about. I mean, I am still, I am still interested in policy, and I did, the, um, I did the Stanford and Washington program while I was here in the winter quarter, which is health policy focused, and my Humbio concentration is in international health and development policy. So though I work on eating disorders with the Eating Disorder Lab, and that sort of led me to my thesis, I have kind of that track going. And then I also have sort of a more international health policy track going. Um, and I'm actually moving to DC next year to be the RA in the Stanford and Washington House and to work part time for a children's health policy advocacy group and part time in a free clinic while I apply to medical school. <laughs> so I kind I don't know. I, it sounds from the beginning. Um, like I had a direct path, I guess, if you say that I did Humbi or HB Rex and that kind of led me to my thesis, which it did, and that was a major part of my undergrad career, but there are many parts to my undergrad career that are disparate and don't really go together, but they've all kind of led me to where I am now. So I decided to get involved in HB Rex, which is the Human Biology Research Program, because during my sophomore year, um, I decided that research was something that should be a part of my undergraduate experience, in part just because Stanford is a world-renowned research facility. And HB Rex kind of came along at the opportune time. It allowed you to sort of pick from a variety of different um, research research fields and projects uh, allowed you to rank the ones that you were interested in and then interview with the PIs, which is the principal investigators in the labs. Um, and I went to, I thought that eating disorder sounded interesting. Um, obviously, I'm a college student. We all know people who have had eating disorders. Um, and I went to go interview with uh, Dr. Dr. Jennifer Carlson and Dr. Rebecca Peebles in the Weight Lab, which is Stanford Lucille Packard Children's Hospital um, Adolescent Group Eating Disorder Program. Um, and they sort of started telling me about some of the projects they were working on, including an, um, a running club for middle school girls to sort of assess how basic activity can impact their attitudes towards eating and exercise. So I decided to go work there and I worked there in the summer after my sophomore year along with five other human biology major girls. Um, so there were six of us, six juniors in the lab and three seniors in the lab that summer. Um, and it really just provided a great opportunity to learn what research is and to work on a lot of different projects and uh, to sort of sit and even just sitting in the room with um, some of the other girls that I was working with and sort of laughing about a variety of different things and exchanging ideas um, and sort of learning even basic things like data entry and how to do that and how to do data analysis uh, all the way through sort of recruiting patients for new studies we were doing and how to do eating disorder interviews which I've done throughout the last two years, which uh, is sort of a two hour long interview with patients about their eating disorder and about how they, uh, how they sort of, how their eating disorder developed over time and how they feel about their body and how much they eat. It's a very involved eating, uh, involved interview process. The thing is that if you, like a, an adolescent who sort of is experiencing like hormonal changes and, 
um, hates their parents and doesn't like school, that's all fine until it's not fine. Because most of the time when it becomes an issue doesn't follow the normal trends. So for eating disorders, most people when they think about eating disorders, they think about um, sort of your traditional teenage girl who wants to be a supermodel and she therefore decides that she's going to stop eating. But in reality, that's not what happens the majority of the time. There are a lot of subsets within the eating disordered population that don't fit the sort of traditional model. There are a lot more males with eating disorders than people recognize, and it's an increasing subset now that it's becoming more recognized. Um, and there are increasing numbers of athletes with eating as well. They, but the thing is that I don't know that it's, those are necessarily increasing numbers so much as people are starting to recognize that eating disorders don't, are not just that subset. Eating disorders are more than that. They are the athlete who thinks that if they eat chicken breasts and broccoli all the time and go running for you know, six miles a day, that's healthy. They are the boy who's decided that he wants to bulk up and is going to only drink protein shakes for four weeks. There, there are a lot of different aspects to it and that's actually why I decided to do my thesis on childhood eating disorders. I think that that, that in particular with um, children is what makes it so interesting is because a lot of people think, oh, well, children are just picky. Children are picky eaters. If my kid only wants to eat bagels and white bread all the time, then that's kind of normal because they're a child. Um, and again, it's sort of a fluid boundary line. You have to sort of just watch what's happening um, and sort of try and figure it out as it goes. So what, what is known about children with eating disorders is that children with eating disorders one, present with lower ideal body weights than adolescents with eating disorders. So that means that usually children uh, have lost more weight or are sort of as it's traditionally defined further along in their eating disorder um, than adolescents with eating disorders are. And that's probably just because of uh, lack of screening or because people think, oh, well, they're growing really quickly because they're a child. Children are supposed to be kind of skinny and gang gangly at some points. Um, and so I think it just takes people a little bit longer to pick up on it when it's in a child. Uh, what's also known is that children also often have other, they're more likely to have pre-morbid psychopathology, which means that they're more likely to have other um, psychiatric disorders at the same time or have had another psychiatric disorder that sort of pro preceded the um, eating disorder. So they're more likely to be an OCD child uh, who has problems with OCD and then that sort of preempted their issues with um, with eating or they're more likely to have an anxiety disorder a different anxiety disorder prior to having an eating disorder it's more likely to be a sort of non-traditional route to an eating disorder and the fact that um, eating disorders are often associated with a uh, sort of sex and image and how women want to be portrayed that's why eating disorders have the stereotype of being teenage girls who are coming into their sort of sexuality and coming into their place in society but that's not the whole story that's it isn't the whole story and that's what people thought 20 30 years ago people thought that often eating disorders were caused by mothers and the mothers were did xyz thing and then the daughter thought that they needed to be perfect and they um did all of these different things to be perfect and being perfect meant having this certain body type or this certain body image uh, in the eyes of others. But we know now that that isn't the whole story. That may be the story for some people with eating disorders, but there are a lot of people for whom um, it's a control thing or it's because they don't like food or it's because they have a choking issue or they, they are afraid of choking or it's because they're OCD and they need their food to be prepared a certain way or it's because they are really just really depressed and it's some other psychological issue and that's what's leading to them not eating or they're athletes and they are cross-country runners and they run a lot and they don't realize that what they're doing is actually detrimental for their bodies or they do realize that and it's um, sort of trying to get attention there's just there's it's a lot more than what people say it is. It's not just 
I'm trying to be thin for other people. I've done a lot of different things throughout my time at Stanford and definitely my time at Stanford in Washington. It's such an awesome program and getting to take classes on health policy. I took classes at nighttime on health policy, but I worked during the day um, at the World Bank with their consultative group to assist the poor doing development policy, which was sort of the perfect marriage of my Humbio, the two sides of my Humbio major. I got to do development policy during the day, take classes on health policy at night, we had environmental, um, an environmental lecture series, so I got to sort of learn about that at the same time. We met with the head of the World Wildlife Foundation, and I met with the de head of the Department of the Interior, and a lot of other schools have biology majors. Um, they have biology majors and they have international relations majors, but they don't have a major like Humbio that allows you to sort of combine the two. I also, another thing I've done in my undergraduate career, spent last summer um, in a rural village called Oyantai Tombo in Peru. Um, and I was working at a sort of rural health clinic and working on a disabilities campaign there, uh, living in a house that didn't have running water um, with guinea pigs running all over the dirt floor for the summer uh, with an awesome, awesome family. And it just sort of makes you, all those experiences just make you think. And like the, the kids I was working with in the disabilities campaign are kids who had cerebral palsy and were really just not doing very well. And they. If they were in the United States, if they were here, they would have so much more, they would have, there, were, there are just so many services for people like that here. Um, and to sort of see what, what these kids had, what had happened to these kids without the same services that we have in the United States, it was just, it's heartbreaking. Um, but also like on the flip side of that, I had an awesome family there. I loved my family. I loved the community there. It was such a, such a more tight knit community um, of people than we have here. So just it's just completely different worlds. There definitely is a disconnect of resources, and there definitely is a disconnect of exchange of ideas across different cultures and across boundaries. And that's really why um, why I think that international health and development policy is so interesting. And it, Honestly, it was really interesting coming back from Peru, where the village I was living in often... There's this bug will not leave me alone. <laughs> um, the village I was living in in Peru, uh, not necessarily in that village, but in more rural areas, people were really struggling to find food. They really only ate um, potatoes and guinea pigs pretty much exclusively. That was their food source. Um, and then to come back to the United States, and I came directly from Peru to, um, to Stanford, where I started working on my honors thesis in the Bing Honors College program. Um, my honors thesis is obviously on eating disorders. Eating disorders are virtually unknown in that community. Um, so obviously there's something going on. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's just to go, it was it was very, very surreal, weird experience to have that happen in a less than 24 hour long period to go from working with people who don't have enough to eat to people who will not eat enough. <laughs>